The Buddha once said that he got on the right path of practice, or started on the right path of practice, when he learned to observe his thinking, noticing which kinds of thoughts were skillful, which kinds were unskillful. In other words, which kinds of thought, which kinds of thinking led to harm, which kinds of thinking didn't lead to harm. And notice he didn't say he got on the path when he learned to stop thinking. It was beginning when he learned to observe his thinking and see it as part of a causal process. This is important because a lot of meditation has to do with thinking. There's a popular misconception that meditation means not thinking at all. But you look at all the descriptions of the Noble Eightfold Path, they all start with right view. Then they continue with right resolve. In other words, they start with thinking, learning how to think in the right way. This is why we have Dharma talks. If thinking weren't involved in the in the practice, if your views weren't important in the practice, Dharma talks wouldn't serve any function. You'd have to teach by example by not saying anything at all. But it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You have to learn how to think in the right way as you come to meditation. This is a thinking cure. In psychotherapy, they talk about talking cures, and they note how amazing it is. It's sometimes simply talking over a neurosis can disband it, getting it out in the open, being very clear about what the presuppositions behind it were, and it loses its power. What we're doing here is learning how to watch our thoughts, be very clear about how the mind thinks, observe how the mind thinks. Learn how to bring up its assumptions, its unexpressed assumptions, or the ones that are just barely expressed, so you can see them in the light of day. And then you can see what kinds of thinking you really believe in, what kinds of thinking you don't. And many times you find that the things that have been having the most power over the mind are the ones that, you, if you really look at them, they don't really make any sense at all. So it's important as you meditate that you have a sense of the, the role and the power of thinking in the meditation. For example, as we're doing breath meditation, trying to get the mind to settle down with the breath, get concentrated on the breath. As the Buddha said, every state of concentration depends on a perception, a mental label that you create, a little message that you create for yourself in the mind that you can then carry from one moment to the next, that you can remember, that you can be mindful of. You hear that message is breath. So what is your concept of the breath? How do you relate to it? We talk about forcing the breath. But the breath isn't the sort of thing you can force. You can force the blood to different parts of your body, and that's oftentimes what we do when we think we're moving the breath around in the body. We're simply changing the way the blood circulates. And we can get ourselves into pretty, some, some pretty strange physical states, and they can have an effect on the mind, because you're forcing the blood too much. In other words, you're playing around with what the, the, the text called the liquid element or the liquid property, and you've missed the breath entirely. But this is the way we often relate to our body. An emotion comes up, and a lot of the physical side of the emotion has to do with the fact that our blood circulation has changed. When we were little children, before we learned any language, we ran up against pain. And one of the ways we dealt with it was try to force it away. We actually used a change in the blood circulation to try to force the pain away. And that became our instinctive way of relating to the body, force the blood, force the circulation. This is why so much of the 
language or the imagery of psychotherapy is in hydraulic mechanics. Emotions get pushed underground, and then they force their way here and force their way where there, in the same way that liquids get get forced around. But as a meditator, you've got to realize there are other ways of relating to the energy in the body. In fact, the only way you can really get in touch with the breath is to reconceive the whole way you relate to the body. The best way to deal with the breath is simply to think, allow. Think of the breath going down the back. You don't push it down the back. Think of the breath going to the different parts of the body. You can't push it that way. If you push it, you're pushing the blood. You're pushing the liquids in the body. All you can do is just think, open up, open up. Keep your wrists relaxed. Keep your ankles relaxed. All your joints, keep them relaxed. Think, okay, I'm opening up passages where, by which the breath can flow. Now, you can't make the breath flow. It's something that's going to do on its own once you've opened the channels. So you maintain the thought of just breath. You might want to picture the body and say, think of breath going down the back, out the legs, down the shoulders, out the arms, all directions. You can keep that picture in mind, but try not to force anything with the body. As soon as you start forcing things, it gets difficult. This is part of the thinking cure, getting a new conception of the breath, learning to hold on to it. And you need to get a new conception of yourself as well, what you can do. Often this is a huge part of the meditation. I remember looking through collections of Dharma talks from the Forest of Johns. And this applies to all of them. There's so much of it is not in explaining things, it's in encouraging. Reminding people that this is something you can do. You can relate to the body in a different way from the way you've been doing it. You can relate to the mind in a different way. As the Buddha once said, if it weren't possible for people to change their ways from unskillful to skillful, he wouldn't teach. He wouldn't have taught, wouldn't have served any purpose. But it is possible. When you've been doing something unskillful, you can change. You realize that there's an other way of doing things. And that you're capable of doing it. It requires a certain amount of imagination. That's the beginning of any change in your behavior. It's just allowing yourself to imagine that you can change the way you behave. That's another part of the thinking cure. And this applies to all aspects of the practice. You start with generosity. When you make up your mind to give a gift, you're imagining yourself as someone with something to spare. Up to that point, you may have been thinking that you're hungry and lacking. And all you could think about was gaining, 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 getting, getting, getting. When you allow yourself to think that you have more than enough, you can give. And you begin to realize it has very little to do with how much you may have materially. Poor people can often be more generous than rich people. Because their idea of enough is different. It's simply a change in your thinking. And you put yourself in a new place, a place of more dignity, a place of more inner worth. The gift of forgiveness is the same sort of thing. Someone else has harmed you. And if all you can think about is how much you're a victim of them, you make yourself a smaller person. But if you're large-hearted enough to forgive, you suddenly become a larger person.
and so on down the line. You learn that you can observe the precepts. You learn that you can meditate. Simply by changing the way you think about yourself and your capabilities. So remember that this is a thinking cure. There do come parts of the practice where you learn not to think, but you have your reasons for not thinking. You're doing it with specific aims in mind. So it's important that you be clear about your aims and where your aims come from, what are the values that lie behind them, what's your understanding of suffering and the end of suffering that lies behind how you do things. So it's important that you straighten out your thoughts. Once you straighten out your thoughts, realizing how suffering comes about and how you can put an end to it, you've got everything you need to put an end to it. It's simply a matter of allowing yourself to think in those ways. Notice the emphasis is on allowing. You don't have to force yourself. You allow something better to happen than what's been happening. John Fuhrer once said that if we could force our way into nirvana, everybody would have been there a long time ago. But it's nothing you can do by force. You ultimately get there only through discernment. And this sermon starts with learning how to think in the right way. It doesn't cost anything, doesn't require a lot of energy. Just allowing yourself to think in skillful ways. That can turn you around right there, head you in the right direction. So before you Stop thinking. Learn how to think in ways that are really helpful. Allow yourself to think in ways that are really helpful, and it'll make all the difference in your practice. <laughs>